no background in predictive sciences. I didn't even know it was a science. No math since high school. No economics since high school. But I ended up in the counterculture right after college where I had a good liberal arts education at a little experimental community in California where the buildings had been designed and led the building led by a guy named Lloyd Kahn, who's the grandfather of the tiny home movement. And um, in order to sneak education into the learning community, which was otherwise a registered high school in the state of California, where all rules had been abandoned, except for no, no hard drugs, which in those days only meant heroin, no rip-offs, and no violence. There were no, we weren't allowed to call ourselves teachers. The students weren't students. We were all at an equal voice. And we were traumatized, the slightly older adults, just out of college, that there was not going to be any learning going on. So we invented a publication. It was, a, it was the first hippie almanac called the Daily Planet Almanac. Lloyd contributed some stuff. And um, it turned out it launched itself into a, a, a rather fabulous um, annual thing that I think it ran for 11 or 12 years. We got international exposure, multiple publishers. And at one point, we had moved out to Colorado. And my partner and I were saying, we want to look more and more like an almanac. And all almanacs, we'd both grown, grown up partly on farms with the old farmer's almanac around. And you had to have weather forecasts. And totally naive. We did, where do you start? And um, open the yellow pages. And sure enough, there was, a guy, there was a category, weather forecasting. And one entry, and it was a guy who was um, PhD meteorologist who did the weather on, God, it's been a long time, maybe Channel 4. If you're, if you're old timers, his name was Ed Pearson, and he's still around. Um, and he made a lot of money working with very large corporations, the Denver Broncos, utility companies, doing very long-range weather forecasts. And we, we were making a lot of money, and we paid him to do our version of the Farmer's Almanac forecasts for a few years until we ended up folding. And he was so good that um, I knew some of the people in, in uh, New Hampshire at Yankee Publications. We introduced him, and they really, really wanted him because they knew how bad their forecasts were. They're basically a joke. Um, but he was smart enough to ask for more money than they were willing to pay. So he faded away, the almanac faded away. And at that point, I had learned how to take ideas because of the multiple years of success with this um, annual publication. If you have an idea, make a book. And it was quite just like a flash one day say, what if you took other things than the weather and you forecast them? And that's where the American forecaster came from. Had an agent, had a sale. It took off. My partner went somewhere else. And I ended up having to learn how to forecast, which is not um, um, really part of the predictive sciences as in you know, the, 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 the whole future industry was really big at the time. Naisbit, um, <clears throat> who was in Colorado had formalized it. Uh, Megatrends had it come out a couple of years ahead of time. And, and it was a very big deal. And I learned early on, I'm not competing with that. I created a, a, a template, essentially reporting on the future that's underway. What's going to be happening in the next year or two? And that's all I've done since then. It's just standard who, what, when, and where. And uh, with you know a little bit of loose thinking sometimes, creative thinking. and. Um, I did that year in and year out um, and got more and more publicity to the point where it was overwhelming and not a lot of book sales. It wasn't a good idea for a book after a while. And um, I just couldn't afford to keep it up. I had other books that I worked on. And in fact, that's what I've been doing since the American Forecaster um, ended its run as a book. And now I occasionally do some consulting and write an occasional special report or an insert in a report um, that someone else is doing that has to do with more general trends, like what are baby boomers up to? How many of them are there? Um, and again, being naive, you look at the figures, 
and you would see a range of figures. This is even 20 years ago. How many baby boomers are there? And even official government sources and statisticians and people with PhDs would just quote these numbers, and there were always um, different numbers. So I opened up the statistical abstract one day, and I counted myself how many babies are born every year from 1946 to when the baby boom ended. And, it can, and then you add however many people, which again, the Census Bureau can provide, of the right age that immigrated into the country, which has added several million more people. So at its peak, it was 79 million. Um, but it's been diminishing. We're now on the downward slide. And most of the people of baby boomer age are not in the category that immigrate to this country. Most of the immigration has now influenced the millennials. So even though the millennials were done being born a long time ago, their numbers can continue to swell. And as of, I think, a, a preliminary report, I haven't checked the figures, which basically just means adding. It's not rocket science, because um, I don't trust the people that, because everyone quotes everyone else, that millennials now equal in number baby boomers and are gradually going to gonna, gonna um, outnumber them. And um, in between, of course, is Generation X, which is another thing I learned, that very, what apparently are very bright people, I've met some of them in person, and brightness is clearly part of it, <laughs> but this idea that you can take people that are of a certain age or were born in a nice, neat calendrical block of 10 years between, say, 1950 and 1959, and somehow they're different from the people that are born between 1960 and 69 because of non-astrological influences, <laughs> although the astrologers have something to say about it. Um, it just didn't make sense to me. And the other thing is lumping baby boomers together. There are credible sources that, that specialize in this and realize it's a, it was a 19-year span. And people who are 19 years apart, or even much less than that, by the time you're five to 10 years apart from people older or younger, that you have different things going on in your life. By the time you start having babies, people 10 years younger than you, you know, are still playing with toys. And people 10 years older than you have already you know, moved on to their second house and their second mortgage and, and much less second marriages. Um, um, so this idea that we're all lumped together is wrong. There's more like niches of what people are doing based on how old they are. In any case, that, that takes me up to the present. And pretty much anything that I look at um, can become an idea spun off into a book or vice versa. The last um, big book I did was about eight years ago. And it was um, another almanac, but it wasn't meant to be annual. It was the Almanac of Political Corruption. And the reason was, it just seemed to me that people were being irrational about how, what was wrong with government. While myself, I think there's a lot of things wrong with government. And um, I got a big, got a big advance, became a big book. It came out uh, during the, um, the, the, the first Obama election. And um, I had one page at the back, which had what figures I could find. And that is, what, what can we track? Well, there has to be something somewhere that's been published. The number, a head count, people thrown out of Congress, caught with their hands in the cookie jar, something. Multiply that by something, anything, for the ones that maybe didn't get caught. And I ended up getting, I got, I got a few inside sources that I wasn't able to quote. So I think, in fact, the reality of the hard numbers, congressmen that have been found guilty, um, anyone, any elected position. So we can go all the way down, in some cases, to sheriffs. But the ones that I could, could count are um, governors and state assemblies and up through the national level. And we're talking total number of people since the country was founded. And it's a couple of percent. And you'd have to multiply that some say, gigantic figure and be somebody who's a truther or something like that, a paranoid, um, to believe, like a lot of people do, that every politician is crooked. It's exactly the opposite. Um, we don't like what they're doing. And one of the things that's gone away in our society, and we misuse the terms, corruption in our country originally melt, meant, borrowed from the English um, across the... Um, the Atlantic was morally corrupt. Now we think of it as, as technically, legally corrupt. You've broken the law. When actually what we spot 
are people who seem like they're coming from another planet, you know, like, like you know, Trump, not to pick on him, he's too easy. So um, um, as, as, as a naive um, presenter, I tried a lot of different things, and um, including for a couple years, I did political predictions, and I had to put them in print. And in the book industry, you have months of advanced work before you're locked in and the printing presses roll. And it's moved up um, a lot tighter in recent years, which is a boon. But back in the day, you know, you could be talking about two to four months. Hence the typo, I don't remember the year, about President Dukakis. <laughs> and, that, and that's when I quit. And the deal was, naively, I said, if the election was held tomorrow, totally meaningless. That's, you know, the, the, the lesson, lesson learned. So looking at 2016, which I'm not doing actively, it's part of a lot of different things, but you know, in honor of tonight, it's kind of a, a dive into a, a, a various areas, a sport, um, and anyone's welcome to um, interrupt, challenge, or, or what, whatever you might uh, um, uh, want to extend with some of the things that I've been looking at. But, um, starting with the book industry, which I pay a lot of attention to. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice feeling, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing this from an unbiased uh, perspective, I hope, that um, the sales of print books are going up. And it's now happened for long enough, for a couple years, in almost all categories. Um, they're being presented to the public in a wider array of areas because they're opening new independent bookstores. This is even while Barnes & Noble can't figure out, you know, they've lost their, whatever it was they had, it's gone. Um, and um, um, they're building new libraries. They're stocking them with books along with computer terminals. Libraries are used for a lot of other things than books. The biggest thing that has been going on for 10 plus years is more kids are reading books. They are now major consumers of books. The biggest uh, by terms of percentage growth, um, new books being published, new imprints at major publishers being founded, uh, distribution, marketing, everything has to do with um, everything from board books, which is the industry term for uh, books for kids just learning to read, ones that parents read to them, through juvenile literature. And it's massive. We're not even talking, you know, movies, television shows, all spinning off of books. And that continues to be a growth area. The worrisome thing, one of the many worrisome things in the industry over the last 10 years, starting with the super chains, Borders and Barnes and Noble, gone away as a threat. What about ebooks? Sales of ebooks have flattened, but it's a relatively new phenomenon, less than a year that the sales have, have flattened. And it would be inappropriate if you wanted to be unbiased to say that means ebooks don't work, I don't like them, therefore they're going away. They're still figuring out people on both ends, the ones that produce them and the ones that consume them, what works. On a tablet, ebooks seem to be really well established. Um, and there's got to be a lot of growth ahead, but almost all of that growth and almost the entire market is fiction. So it's people who are large consumers of. Well, you know, I, it, it sounds like a derogatory term, I don't, you know, but I use it because I come from the old school of uh, pulp fiction. And it's romance novels. Uh, the whole, that whole industry splintered into niches. There's now Christian science fiction. You know, I think there's 10 categories just in Christian fiction alone. Um, and all of those have the same basic model, which is they're, they're, they're recognizable templates. The writing's not necessarily bad, but it's not intended to be what's called commercial fiction which is more like James Patterson, who's his own phenomenon, um, or uh, literary fiction, which is its own phenomenon. And um, all of those are growing, but not necessarily in leaps and bounds. But it seems like we can, we can say to say the book is not dead and it's not going away. The rest of the print industry, it's a mixed message. Um, although Lisa's brother's not here, uh, John Lendorf, who can't have a discussion about newspapers without declaiming um, that they're completely dead, um, him, you know, having worked at the Rocky Mountain News through its demise. I think there's something positive yet to happen in print 
in print newspaper, but only because they have an online presence. Not that if you saw the deal that's happened with the, with the Las Vegas Sun, uh, it was a big brouhaha because the announcement of the sale at an exorbitant price was to an undisclosed individual. And the paper itself, with its onboard sleuthing, it took them two weeks to find out who the buyer was. And it turns out it's a, it's a, it's a billionaire who's a big donor in the GLP, um, um, Allison. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean anything good or bad. Um, but paying over a market price for, for a newspaper is definitely a worrisome sign. Something is not right there. But newspapers online, I think, are the chief source of real news in the country. Um, even though broadcast news on television is having problems in declining, and has for decades, with declining viewership because of competition from other sources, anybody, you don't have to be trained, you don't have to, all you have to do is listen to the evening news anywhere in the country, and you will hear them read the news from the newspaper. Their staffs are shrinking. Uh, when a big international events happen, um, um, the three, or now four with Fox, um, national broadcast networks, had almost no coverage on the ground in Paris. And the only one that still had enough people left over there was CNN. And they've started to build back up. The value of that isn't covered by income. And so who knows where, you know, the news is going to continue to be battered. But the newspapers, traditional print journalism, provides the core of where they get information from. Magazines, um, print sales are, are, are down for, or rack sales, they call them. But that represents traditionally only 10% of where the income from magazines come from. The rest of it is, is um, advertising and subscriptions. And both of those are up and down. It's hard to say. If what I think is going to happen with magazines, I think they're robust enough. Some of them are actually growing and making money. But if you look at, um, I'm not sure about here in Westminster, but um, Colorado is a very innovative state with libraries. And Denver Public, um, at least if you have a library card, you can check out virtual magazines. They have not every magazine, but they have most of the major magazines. And it, you, can, you can read them streaming. They have an app, which for me, I, I've been trying it. It hasn't worked yet. And I haven't asked for help because I like to find out what other people might be discovering that's not good. Um, you can download them as a PDF, so you can read them offline. And that's all covered by the library budget that's paid for by taxes. You already have the right to do that. Full text, Wall Street Journal, New York Times has, all, has been there for 20 years. We were the pioneer in the country and pretty much in the world for the development of online access to digital materials through a public library. Western History, the Digital Photo Project, all the beta that was being developed for the Library of Congress was at the library building downtown Denver. Um, and it's still very robust and it's still growing and there's still, there's still some changes coming. Um, I'm looking at um, online retail. Christmas season, that's where a lot of things are gone. And I've looked at it for a number of years. The general trend can't not continue to happen. It's just so much easier for people to find what they want. It's more convenient. I think those people who were holding back and worried about security, despite the trend which is going to grow with hacking, um, that more and more people are willing to buy things online. And the Christmas season, at least, is always going to kind of uh, continue to batter at brick and mortar retail sales. The question is, what's going to change in how things are delivered? And I think one of the things that's happening, um, it's not so much under the radar, we just don't see it. And it's, it's like boat, boutique delivery and distribution. Um, it's drop shipping through satellite places that in many cases it's not Amazon. It's a third party entrepreneurial opportunity that realizes they can cut a deal with a mom and pop greeting card company. Greeting cards, by the way, are doing fine, billions of dollars of sales. But most, a lot of that is through online stuff. And instead of, of having the order 
end up directly, if you're ordering through Etsy or Facebook or Pinterest or whatever, and it goes directly to the owner's warehouse or printing facility, it's drop shipped through a local warehouse. And there's, there's enough meat in the transaction that entrepreneurs are already starting to find they can just, they can, they can set themselves up and they'll do all the dirty work, fulfilling the orders. Um, I think that's going to grow a lot more and it's just going to enhance the whole trend that things are going to work better for more people to order online. The question mark is, and this is, this is a pretty big deal now and it's happening locally as well as nationally and it's pretty much in a rush, and that's uh, local food delivery. And um, again, because I made up my own rules when I did this and I decided early on I was not going to cater to investors. So I don't, I don't endorse. Um, uh, the, the, the answer is I don't know. It, it seems improbable to me that it's going to be a huge deal. There's a few indicators that, that home delivery is already screwed up. There's two or three companies nationally that are recent startups. They've already folded. There's competition. And the question, which is biggest, that really can't be answered, I don't believe honestly, is what are what do consumers really want? Are there enough of them that that makes sense because there's a surcharge? And one of the biggest things that's been happening, um, even you know, before the last recession, people don't necessarily pinch pennies, but they watch how they spend their dollars. And you're, there's already the biggest thing happening in the grocery industry is the fight for price. That's where Sam's Club, that's where the Kmart super centers, um, all that stuff came from Costco, Sam's Club, is consumers want to spend less money for food. So where are all these consumers that have come from that are going to want to spend more money for food? I don't think convenience is enough factor to drive it, but that's just a cautionary thing. So I'm, I'm watching to see that and see how it, um, yeah. Uh, or actually a comment. <clears throat> I'm aware that, I became aware that there is a wholesale industry involving auto parts here in the metro area and I assume nationally where they have con people contracting who are in turn having subcontractors picking up the parts to repair your car all over <coughs> the metro area and shuttling them to the repair shops uh, all around town six days a week or maybe seven. Um, so you've got in the industrial area, in the wholesale area, uh, a viable business. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a physical product, the concept of rapid delivery is not new. What is, is the technology, the logistics to speed up the supply chain, lots of stuff, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. and the people who are in the vehicles, the subcontractors who are driving their own vehicles, uh, have to have a tablet and be connected either through uh, the phone system or Wi-Fi or somehow, because that's when they're, you know, they're, they're sitting downtown, okay, the next order is go down here, pick it up, and run it out to Broomfield. Um, an historical anecdote. Again, I didn't know any better, so sometimes I, I would look to history. Um, for examples, I come from Indianapolis, haven't been back. Um, it just wasn't right for me, but it's the home of auto racing. And so I've always been fascinated, read about that kind of stuff, and there's, there was uh, only one or two books that's ever come out about the guy that really is responsible for making the Indianapolis <laughs> 500 work. And uh, I forget his first name, that's Fisher. Um, I may think of it in a minute. Started out with a bicycle store, moved into cars, was starting to make some money. And he had a wad full of cash, the anecdote goes, and he's at a diner, the outskirts of Indianapolis. The 500 may have already been launched at that point uh, on a dirt track, I don't remember. But he's walking into the diner and he sees guy he classifies as a salesman. He was dressed like a salesman. He had a car and he had a, a salesman's trunk, which back in the day was recognizable to regular people. And he was, he was wrestling with it. It was big and heavy. So Fisher stops and helps him out. They start talking. They go in and have a cup of coffee. Ends up this guy had a startup venture that he couldn't make work. And he sold the whole thing for, I think, a few hundred, few thousand dollars in cash to Fisher who figured out how to make it work. And it was the world's very first overnight delivery concept. And as Fisher was making money in a small way locally, he became an international 
uh, by international standards, wealthy within a couple of years. The deal was, how did cars, which were just starting to take off, they were everywhere, along with buggies, how do you light your way at night? Didn't, didn't, you know, electricity really hadn't come in yet. You didn't have batteries in cars. You cranked them to start. It was carbide lights, which had only been used in the mining industry before. So there was all kinds of companies, dozens of companies making carbide lights for vehicles. You had to, basically what it is is the acetylene that's made by dropping some water on, uh, if somebody knows, you can, carbide, yeah, it's, it, it forms acetylene on the spot. And um, <coughs> what Fisher did, it was a wheeler dealer de thing that he had to work with all kinds of different components of different industries, and he got it launched within a year or two. If you bought into this system, you never had to mix your own carbide again. You had a tank of acetylene that you could pick up and exchange any time you were low or ran out at the local railroad station, wherever it was east of the Mississippi, in the first stage of development. And the railroads who had lots of downtime in between the clerks and stuff who were being paid full time, were now part of the system. When trains came in going to a hub, they would load empty canisters on and unload full canisters. The empty canisters would end up at a hub where they were all filled in a little plant. They had various plants around the Midwest. So you had overnight fulfillment of pre-filled acetylene tanks. And Fisher was smart enough to realize this isn't going to last very long because electricity is being adapted for use in cars. So he sold it to a group of bankers in New York City <laughs> and who did not fail in their mission because they were flexible too. And they had formed a company called Union Carbide. Yeah. And that's how they got started. Fisher went on to make and lose a couple fortunes. He founded Miami Beach. Um, he tried to build the first um, um, highway that would be practical for cars. And he got every, the president of every car company in the US to sign on except one. And that was Henry Ford. And they all knew each other. And so he went in at one point with Henry. He says, Henry, you're holding things up. He says, we've got to make this happen. Think of how many cars we sell. And Henry said, he said, Fisher, you got it all wrong. He said, he said, this is not something. Why should we spend our money? Let the government do it. And he says, I'm not budging. And that's what's going to happen. It's going it's to be taxed. We'll have highway funds. Take a little bit longer. But private ownership of roads, nah. And, and he was right. So, um, so the, 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 one of the main things um, I, was, I was looking at, because of uh, starting with a personal battle, uh, this may have, have been happening more and more to you. And so, some of it is just, is just aggravation, which really doesn't count for much. And it's um, um, surfing the web, which I, I'm entertained by, but I, I do it for business. I mean, I'm on all the time. I have been since the, you first got up with it. You could get a dial-in modem and go to paid bulletin board systems. Um, ad ads online have gotten really obtrusive in the last couple of years to the point where I have a problem doing my work. Um, I have nothing against advertising in itself. Um, and, and so it's not, it's not the company that's advertising or the advertising um, um, a mechanism or the fact that people are making money off of it. It's the fact that they're now bouncing around the screen. My favorite is um, on the New York Times, uh, if, at least if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're using Firefox. They have a little banner at the bottom that comes up that won't allow you to click it off because it bounces away from your mouse. <laughs> so, um, which was only amusing one time. <laughs> and it develops your mouse skills because if you can catch up to it and click on the little X, it will go away until the next time that you log on. Um, and that's the free version. I'm not going to subscribe or give them any money which they deserve. I would be happy to give them if that's how they treat me as a customer. Um, so on Firefox, a, a nonprofit has the most, it's, it's, they cannot keep up with business, even though they started as a nonprofit. It's just called ad blocker. And they're now, they're, that's their actual term of their, of their, um, of their software. But it, it, it's the term that's being used in, in generically in the whole industry. It's ad blocking. And it's updated all the time, and it's a battle now. And it's, it's, it's predators and prey, back and forth. And there's half a dozen things that Adblocker hasn't quite caught up to, 
and as soon as they catch up to them, like um, um, the, the, if, the, if it isn't auto already, automatically recognize it, and it's not even there. You don't even see the ad. You right click on whatever is there, still traditional looking display ad, a moving banner, a video, whatever it is, and there's in your right click menu, it'll say um, um, add this to the ad blocker menu, whatever. And you click on it and it's gone away. Well, some of the big places like the New York Times and places that have money, they can put the same moving ad up with who knows how many different names. So ad blocker hasn't figured out how yet, but he will. It's a, it's, it's, it would be a game if it in fact doesn't represent something that's really important and serious because that money supports a lot of stuff that's going on online that doesn't have subscription fees. That part of it's important. What's going to shake out of this part where on an iPad, much less an, a, 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 a smartphone, you can't even sometimes see the content. It's gotten that far. That's egregious. That is, I mean, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. And um, so I'm now starting to see that that is um, what the industry is addressing. They're having seminars. Um, I just got a survey, which I normally don't take, on the subject to see what kinds of questions they were asking. And that was all of the questions. How, how, how much advertising will you tolerate? Will you tolerate it if it moves, if it has sound, if it doesn't have sound? Do you appreciate what advertising dollars do? They understand the problem, and it's an evolution in progress. And that part of it is, is utterly fascinating, and we'll see that going on underway for the next year. Which brings me to apps, which I think are uh, it's one of the more robust areas. And um, uh, running across lots of, in the evolution of that, which has just been underway for a few years, what is the future of apps? And it's being developed as we speak. One critical component is invisible, and that's how businesses are using apps to get the critical information they need to track who you are, why are you at that site. It's like cookies. But they're using apps which they're willing to give away for free in exchange for something. And um, um, on, the, on the top end, the visible end, I don't think it's a problem to have t there's such a thing as too many apps. And there's literally, what, hundreds of thousands of them? Great, so what? So you have to go through a directory or you have to hunt to find one. I don't think that's the problem. The problem is usage. And so what I'm reading about now are some people are understanding that it's an issue for many consumers who are app addicted, which is not a negative. Apps can be very positive. You have to close down apps and open up new ones. And each one is singular and focused. And this one is you know, where you are in the city. And this one is the recipes for tonight's dinner. And so they're aggregating uses of apps, I don't, I don't think it's the right term, but just you know, as I was writing notes for tonight, it's like a mega app. So you open one app, and there can be multiple applications for how you would actually use it. And it's to cut down on the, on the consumer effort to make the app be a useful tool. That's progress. I think you know, we, we, we would benefit um, um, as that happened. Um, did you want me to keep going on? Or? Let's take a uh, quick break. We transition. All right. Um, all right. Thanks for coming tonight. We're um, we're going to try to uh, twist your thinking a little bit, and I think Kim did a great job of uh, touching on some uh, important topics here. Um, so, those of you who don't know about the Visionarium, that's that's our consulting arm of the Da Vinci Institute. We use different techniques in the Visionarium to help stretch people's imaginations. So, I'll uh, use some of those techniques here tonight. <clears throat> but in the past, we built great companies by putting a lot of smart people in the same room together. We did that through proximity. Um, we, we tend to choose where we want to live, where we want to build our business, based on um, proximity to key assets. <clears throat> so some of those assets are things like, um, where's, where's my job at, where's the house, where's schools, good schools, the crime rate in the area. Um, how close am I to the airport? Every one of us has their own criteria that we use for making a decision as to which is, which is the best place to locate. 
Um, <clears throat> but the thing is, is with proximity, proximity is changing. And so we're an increasingly mobile society, and today we have ways to compensate for physical proximity, and tomorrow we're going to have a lot more. So we have telepresence rooms now going in all, all around the world, and it gives you kind of the feeling of being in the same room with people, but it's still not quite there yet. We're getting closer. Um, and tomorrow, uh, telepresence will be all the way into like water cooler conversations. We'll have people that we can talk to on the other side of the world casually. And uh, so we're improving things little by little. Now, I've made this prediction that by 2030, over 2 billion jobs are going to disappear. Um, I get quoted on this in magazines and newspapers literally all over the world. Um, now, this wasn't intended to be some doom or gloom statement. It wasn't intended to say we're going to have uh, 2 billion unemployed people in the world. What I'm, what I'm saying is this is a wake-up call. We have to transition jobs at a far faster rate than ever before, and so we have to figure out how to create new, new, a lot of new positions. This is what I refer to as the level problem. Now, most of us have this tool at home. This is a level. Um, we use it to straighten pictures on the wall, to do some carpentry work. But once you download a level app, then suddenly you don't need this tool. That means that you don't have to have somebody build the aluminum frame. We don't have to have somebody that builds the glass bulbs, that it does the assembly work, the shipping and the receiving, the retail stores that handle it. Every time we download a mobile app, we eliminate a piece of the job. It's a very tiny piece, but as we're downloading <coughs> billions upon billions of mobile apps, we're eliminating a lot of jobs. Um, so Oxford uh, researchers, they analyzed skills for over 700 different jobs. They concluded that machines are going to take over, or replace roughly 47% of today's jobs. That works out to right around 2 billion jobs. So that was nice of them to kind of <laughs> corroborate what I was saying there. <clears throat> but it, the thing that a lot of people get wrong is it's not just the low-level jobs. We're not just replacing uh, the janitorial staff and the, uh, and the drivers. Actually, Uber is automating middle management jobs out of existence. They're doing it with software. Uh, Airbnb, middle management jobs just gone. They can operate with uh, far greater efficiency. They've eliminated a huge percentage of the overhead the companies had, and, and those middle management jobs are going away. So there are no safe industries right now. This is, uh, this is a graphic that has all the fintech companies on it. Um, in the United States right now, there are right at 8,000 startups in the, the, the fintech space, the financial tech sector. They're being funded by $12 billion in venture capital money just this year. Um, and I like to think of this as the, uh, the, the little piranhas taking bites out of the giant whales. Um, this is death by a thousand paper cuts. This is just one industry here. Smart home world right now. These are healthcare startups. Uh, again, they're attacking um, the, the big players out there. Good entrepreneurs have a way of sniffing out where the money is. And this is a lot of places where the money tiny revenue stream to get started and then they build up from there. Now what's happening is the scalability is, is changing overnight. So this gives some indication here the adoption speed of uh, reaching 50 million users. Radio took 38 years, TV 13 years and we thought it was really fast when Twitter was able to do it in nine months and then along came Angry Birds and did it in 35 <laughs> days. <laughs> but we are, we are on the verge of being able to launch companies reaching 50 million users in as little as a week, maybe just a couple days. That changes everything. You, you can get blindsided by a competition you didn't even know existed just two days earlier. Where did these guys come from? So there's this interesting trend about the iterators versus the innovators. 
Uh, Deb and I go to the Consumer Electronics Show every year. Um, and we, when we go to the Consumer Electronics Show, there's televisions everywhere, thousands and thousands of televisions. Every year, the TVs are a little bigger, a little thinner, a little more curved, slightly better screen, slightly better dynamic range, slightly better cover uh, colors. Um, and, and the list goes on, slightly faster processor, a little more storage, they have new apps, um, uh, slightly better connectivity. So a friend of mine always comes back from the Consumer Electronics Show and he says, you know, there was just nothing new. And what's, what's really new though, is that we're making all these baby steps. We're inching along and television today is hugely better than it was 20 years ago. Uh, we have some amazingly good technology coming out of these, uh, these companies, but it's happening one little baby step at a time. Usually when some big innovation happens, we don't even know about it because it, uh, uh, we have to go through the bad stage first. I mean, this innovation is terrible. The first printing press was, was terrible. Uh, just like the very first television, that was crappy. Uh, what we have today is pretty amazing. So on one hand, we're, we're eliminating lots of jobs. On the other hand, we're freeing up lots of human capital. So how should we be applying this, this human capital? And, and we know that we're not gonna run out of work to do in the world. Uh, that's fairly ludicrous. They know we don't have any work left to do in the world. Yeah, have you looked around? But having the jobs lined up for the work that needs to be done, that's a whole different, different issue. And yeah, we're gonna have a lot of gaps there. So over the past 30 years, um, the new jobs come from companies with less, less than five years old. Um, uh, so the Kauffman Foundation has been doing a lot of research on this. So it's all the, the startup companies, they're the ones that are generating all the new jobs. <clears throat> so where will our next generation jobs come from? And this is the thing that's kind of uh, this anxiety in the back of everybody's mind. Is my job still going to be around five years from now, ten years from now? Uh, the answer is future industries. That's where we're going to get all the, the, the new jobs from. So when it comes to this whole idea of scalability, these are the new guys on the block. These are the ones, the, the new startups that have just scaled instantly. So these are the unicorn companies. And you can see this is 2011, you get to 2012, and then in 2014, all of a sudden, these unicorn companies started coming out of the woodwork. And now um, it's, it's like an exponential growth curve of these billion dollar uh, startups. So these are the ones that are really setting the stage for lots of the growth that's happening in the world right now. Um, in the sensor world, and I love, uh, love the whole area of sensors, we have sensors for all kinds of different things. When the, the first smartphones came out, the iPhone in 2007 it first came out, it had five sensors on it. Now smartphones have 19 sensors on them. Um, so we are doubling the number of sensors on smartphones every four years. Um, and so the number of smartphones being sold is ramping up in 2000, 2020, we'll be selling two billion smartphones a year. That's a lot of sensors being sold. There's a lot of money to be made in the sensor world right now. Um, here's a few unusual quick trends. Inhalable cocktails. Um, so this allows people to inhale your alcohol as opposed to, to drinking it. Uh, is that better? Is this gonna compete with our marijuana here? I don't know. <laughs> Um, so on our event on the January 22nd, are we going to have this? I don't know, but uh, it would be fun having some company here to do that. Um, stool banking. This is, this is kind of way out in the left field. Um, this is a healthcare thing that people are actually saving their fecal matter uh, to help them later on in life as their, their health starts going in the wrong direction. Um, is that a little strange? Um, 
uh, Chimerican Entertainment. Uh, China is, is uh, funding a lot of the movies right now, including um, The Last Mission Impossible, uh, Rogue Nation. They've, um, uh, so lots, lots of money coming from China. And that's also one of the biggest new markets for movies. Um, so here's, here's an interesting tidbit here. The, 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 the group that makes the most movies every year is actually Bollywood in India. Um, the one that makes the second most movies in the world every year is actually called Nollywood out of Nigeria. And so there's lots of African movies being created right now. They're certainly not at Hollywood caliber, but uh, a lot of stuff they're, they're learning. They're doing a lot of experimenting. Um, the new omnivores. This is actually a vegetarian burger. Um, and this uh, company called Impossible Foods is making things that look and taste very much like uh, real, uh, real beef. And so 60% of the millennials are uh, are working, uh, the, they'll consume alternative uh, meats. Um, when I was in uh, New Zealand uh, about a month ago, I was on stage with, uh, uh, I, f I forget his name, Mark or something. Anyway, he's, he's in Holland and he's working on um, the, uh, the growing, uh, lab-grown beef. And so the lab-grown beef, they put it in these vats, and it takes seven months to brew up a batch of beef. <laughs> and the first hamburger that they made, uh, actually the cost of making it was 350,000 euros. <laughs> and uh, so they had uh, some food critics that were tasting it on, in London uh, on the air, uh, trying it out. And nobody was smiling when they were tasting it. It was like, oh man, this is kind of like beef, I guess. <laughs> so they're, they're wondering, can we actually save all the cows and grow our own beef in, the, in these giant vats? Um, I don't think we, we're going to go that direction anytime soon. So, um, But something like this, the, the Impossible Foods, I think has the potential to really catch on because it's getting really close to looking and tasting like, like real beef. The, the gaming world is going off in lots of different directions right now. We have a gamers class here that uh, we have very talented people in our class and very talented instructor, but we have all the virtual reality stuff, the art, um, the, and gaming, they're all kind of converging into giving us lots of new tools for doing things we never uh, could do in the past. Um, tech naturalism, um, there's, there's kind of this growing uh, sense that technology and nature is just fine. So we bring all our tech stuff on camping trips with us. Um, and so that's, that's a shift in attitudes. Um, the 3D landscape scanning, this is, uh, this is cool stuff. They're, they're able to create these unusual images of things now with uh, these 3D scanners. I'll show you just a few of them here. Um, and, and they can see through buildings too. And uh, this is scanning through a ship here. Um, and I'll, I'll just go into the whole 3D printing stuff here. Um, we're we're going to create this hyper individualized consumer marketplace. In, uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show we went to in January, the first booth we went to, we, uh, I actually sat down and had my inside of my ear scanned and um, then they took that three-dimensional image and they proceeded to 3D print earbuds for me mm. that were perfectly fitted for my ears. Mm. Now these may not look like much, but these are the most comfortable earbuds I've ever owned. Uh, I can actually sleep with them on an airplane. And uh, um, so this is going to revolutionize the whole hearing aid industry. Um, and it's setting the stage for lots of other things that are designed for us personally. Um, so uh, a couple months ago, I was over in South Korea, and they had me stand inside this photo booth here. They had me pose, and then they proceeded to 3D print a little statue of me that's about eight <laughs> inches tall. Um, and it, they, they 3D printed it in full color, and uh, and. So we are rapidly transitioning 
from taking selfies to doing shapies. Uh, that's the new trend here. Um, now these run roughly $300. They had people lined up to have this done over there. Um, I've been trying to work with the, the company over there to see if we can bring that to, to Colorado here. Because I think uh, they make, somebody can make a ton of money doing that real fast. So the machines, the 3D printers that print this, these are $100,000 $100, machines that print in full color uh, at that resolution. Uh, it's a pretty good, pretty good uh, piece of equipment. Now the 3D printing world was started by this guy, Charles Hull, back in the early 1980s. And um, he was originally printing in just plastics and resins. Now we have hundreds of different materials that you can print with, including um, we can put wood fibers into 3D printers now, and we can print things like smart wood, uh, macadamia nut shells that was just printed with that, instant tea. I have no idea why anybody would want something printed with instant tea. Um, and I, I don't even know if it would survive. But then Carnegie Mellon and Disney, they figured out how to print with wool, and they can now print teddy bears. I mean, how cool is that? Um, but you go shopping 10 years from now for clothing, the first thing you'll do is you step into a body scanner. And as they're scanning and getting all your body dimensions, then you can walk around and you can pick out whatever styles, colors, fashions you're interested in, and then they will 3D print your clothes while you're waiting. This is actual 3D printed clothing. Um, and we can get really complicated fashions, things we can't make with needles and thread. And uh, this is uh, a short video here. Um. <clears throat> So she's an Israeli fashion designer, um, young girl. She 3D printed all of this clothes in her own house. So a lot of this isn't, it's not good Colorado stuff. It doesn't keep you very warm. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know what it's doing now. Um, so the... Um, it's not just our clothes, it's also our shoes, so we can scan in our feet. And I don't know anybody that doesn't have problems with their feet, so having shoes that fit perfect every time. Um, these are kind of cool shoes. Now this is not ready for prime time just yet, but very soon. There are shoe printers out there. Um, this is a, a company out of London that has figured out how to print with different levels of squishiness and then make an entire shoe that's form-fitted perfectly for your foot. Um, we're going to start seeing all of this very soon here. Um, now contour crafting is um, actually taking 3D printing to another level here. Um, it's uh, printing with concrete one, one layer at a time. This is fast drying concrete that's fiberglass reinforced. And if you think about the way concrete pumpers work, they're pumping material in there, and then they're able to print an entire structure this way. Um, one layer upon another layer upon another layer. Now as this technology was being in, in put together, and by the way, these guys are building a castle here, in case you're wondering. Um, now there was a competition to actually to see who could actually 3D print the first house, and then kind of several groups were working on it, but this guy out of uh, China, uh, it runs Wind, Wind Sun um, Design Company, they've printed 10 houses in one day. They not only printed 10 houses in one day, uh, they got them down to around $5,000 each uh, in printing. Now these aren't very fancy houses. Um, they're not bad though, there's lots of homeless people in China. And then, uh, then kind of uh, a few months ago then they printed this entire mansion. 3D printed the entire mansion. Um, if you look closely at the edges, you can see it's kind of rough around the edges, but it's still structurally pretty sound. And by the way, they also printed a four-story building just to show that they could do it. Mm -hmm. Now this dramatically changes the whole construction industry. Um, 
Now, this is what a lot of people are thinking, is that we will be able to set up a rig around the outside and 3D print an entire house. And as 3D printing progresses, we're not just printing the structure, we will also be printing the wiring in the walls, we'll be printing the plumbing in the walls, print the, the toilets and the sinks in the bathroom. Um, in fact, sometime in the future, if you get tired of your house, you can just grind it up and reprint it. Um, now, now, a lot of cities are going to have a hard time with this because they don't know how to, how to inspect things like this, and <laughs> we're going to have a lot of challenges. And then we have a very disposable mindset then, so what is real estate worth in the future? Uh, it's going to raise lots of interesting questions. So there's lots of ideas on how these machines can work. This one's with a central crane doing everything. And then this company, uh, Bet Abrams out of Slovenia, is now selling a house printer for $16,000. So what are you guys waiting for? You can just go get one and run with it. This is uh, one house printer that's being developed. Uh, this is another one. This is actually the largest, world's largest 3D printer right now. And we're going to have larger ones in the future, but this is a fairly big one. Um, but more than likely, the interim step on this is going to be 3D printing blocks and, or bricks or something and actually assembling walls this way. Um, and so this Australian Fast Brick Robotics is a company that I love how this, um, how this is working. Um, See, it, it's actually taking the blocks up to the top, and it goes through this over this arm, one block at a time. This animation shows it very clearly, um, and it shows how they're routed around. Then, and it's it's right in here is where they're applying the material. Um, and so this is not just an animation. This company actually exists. This is the, the actual machine. Um, and here's, here's the thing. They can do 1,000 bricks per hour. Is that going to take a few people's jobs? Yeah. Probably. Um, that's pretty interesting, I think, anyway. But once we're able to actually 3D print our walls, we no longer have the need for flat walls. Every wall can be an artistic centerpiece. We can get very creative in all this. Um, we can build things for our plants. We can build the outside of the walls so that we can have lots of interesting surfaces. Architects are going to have a heyday with this because they can create freeform structures unlike anything ever designed in the past. And our very definition of what a house is, what a office looks like, what a condo is, all of that's going to change in the future as we uh, get very creative in, in working with this. Um, this one, it just looks like a wad of paper there. I don't know what that's going to turn out like. <laughs> um, and we can get scale up to the really big things. We're going to have newspaper headlines over the, the next few years that this is the first 3D printed post office. This is the first 3D printed hospital. This is the first 3D printed baseball stadium. This one could be the first 3D printed floating island. I love floating islands. I love, I love them a lot. I think we need to build this. We <laughs> are. Okay. Um, and then the drone world. Um, I'll just touch on this because uh, this is going to go off in so many different directions. Uh, this is the latest version of Amazon's flying delivery drone. Now there's problems with this, the delivery drones. This has a five pound capacity. Um, so uh, this, the industry is still pretty crude. So if you order a bottle of shampoo to be delivered from Amazon, at currently, that means that there's somebody who's piloting that drone from the warehouse to your house to drop it off and then piloting the empty drone back to the warehouse. How they can afford to do that for something that's really cheap, I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. And then where is it okay to deliver it? I mean, can we deliver it just on the driveway? Is there some designated spot? How about if you live in an apartment complex or you're in an office building? Where do you deliver stuff? We haven't designated that. 
And if FedEx and UPS gets into this, they're going to want something where you can deliver um, uh, at least uh, uh, have a machine that can deliver at least 10,000 trips, maybe 20,000 trips. We haven't seen those industrial grade machines yet. So we're just on the very early stages of this industry, but the opportunity is going to be absolutely huge. And it's scaring the FAA in a big way too. Um, I love this one here. Um, This is a young Canadian inventor that actually created this. It's not flying over the trees. Yeah. Yeah, I love how he lands it there. Um, let me take one thing off here. There we go. Okay, we're having some interference here with things going on in the background. So while everybody hears about the delivery world, um, most of the drone world is work, working with cameras and surveillance, uh, that sort of thing, right now. Um, I wrote a column a few months ago on 192 future uses for flying drones, and a uh, lot, of, lot of crazy ideas just to are coming out of the woodwork. Emergency warning drones, if there's uh, a flood coming, we send out drones to warn everybody. Insect killing drones, P.O. box drones. I love the idea of having all the mail put in a P.O. box and then the, the box itself turns into a drone and flies directly to you <laughs> to be delivered. Um, if we need to send something back, we have a drone, we can put it in and just return it. Uh, food and product sample drone. Here, try some of this, try some of that. Um, bird frightening drones, if you have crops like sunflowers and have problems with birds, you can scare them away. And then uh, the prankster drones, um, this is an example of a prankster drone here. <laughs> yeah, um, but drones are going to go off in thousands of different directions. Um, the, the one thing that people aren't understanding is that um, they're going to, uh, we're, we're suddenly going to get into having fleets of drones. And so people aren't going to be satisfied. And, and this is going to be uh, a big ego thing. How many, how many drones do you have in your fleet? Oh, I have 200. Oh, that's nothing. We got 500 in ours. So, um, so we'll have drone command centers. We're, We'll have lots of fleets that are deployed uh, for doing various things. And this creates lots of jobs for people that can run these command centers. Um, so if you think about all of the groups that are going to have fleets of drones, every police department, every fire department, news organization, sports teams, stadiums, forestry departments, national parks, power plants, uh, college campuses, airports, farmers, construction companies, shipping docks, theme parks, um, uh, prisons, military installations, weather monitoring. So I've been predicting that we'll reach a, a billion drones in the world roughly around 2030, and it's largely because of these fleets of drones that, uh, that get developed. So every time you have a heart attack on a golf course, there'll be a drone that can help out. Uh, every cop driving around will be able to deploy drones to chase down the bad guys. But don't just think that drones are for flying. Uh, drones can roll along the ground. They can stick to the sides of buildings. They can float in a river. They can dive underwater. They can jump onto a building. And I've seen them jump onto a two-story building. Uh, they can climb a tree. Um, they can attach themselves like parasites to the sides of cars and trains and airplanes. So a lot of the drones in the future will have multiple capabilities built into them. So that's, that's a lot of the drone world here. So I will uh, wrap up with uh, some strange predictions here. The, the next major league sport in the world is going to be video games. Um, so the Electronic Sports World Cup. 
They're already getting over 45,000 people in South Korea to attend video game tournaments, uh, million dollar prizes. Um, it's a big deal uh, and it's going to get bigger. Uh, cities, I think, are going to actually build gaming tournament centers, uh, facilities designed specifically for video game tournaments. Uh, cable TV will disappear by 2030. The cable, the cord cutters are going to win. Um, the Internet of Things will virtually eliminate theft because we can tag anything of any value uh, in the future. Uh, although we might just breed a higher caliber of criminal too along the way. So, um, the world's first trillionaire is going to come from the cryptocurrency world. Um, now, when Bitcoin got invented, it was open source. So now as a result of that, there's over 3,200 cryptocurrencies in existence today. And, but only 28 of them have gotten any traction. A lot of people just created uh, uh, their own currency just to say they have their own money. So, <laughs> uh, Driverless cars are going to change transportation as dramatically as an invention of the automobile itself. Um, and driverless cars will cause accident rates to plummet, auto insurance industry to die, and traffic cops and traffic courts are going to be out of a job. Couldn't happen to a nicer group there. <laughs> um, by 2030, the average person will own printed clothing, live in a printed house, have packages delivered by drones, own more than one robot, work as a freelancer, frequently use driverless cars, and will be capable of accomplishing 10 times what the average person can today. And uh, so I, with that, I will wrap up here. And uh, so I thought what we would do is we would kind of open this up for any questions that any of you might have and uh, turn it into an interesting discussion. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs>
but it's it's whole this whole opportunity cost that goes along with it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to, to get my degree, which uh, everybody puts a lot of uh, value on this degree, not all the employers do though, um, and, and so they spend a lot of money taking courses that are uh, substandard courses. Um, so, so I went through and I evaluated all the classes I took in college and I thought, well, which one was <coughs> the least valuable class that I took? The, for me, the least valuable one was the course in slide rules that they required me to take. <laughs> um, and I was arguing with my instructor at the time, do I really need to take this? And he said, he says, yeah, all engineers need to know how to run slide rules. Um, and so I, I took the course and passed it, but then I never used a slide rule ever <laughs> since. Um, calculators were coming out. They were pretty expensive at the time, but um, I mean, the engineers working at Hewlett Packard and Texas Instrument at the time would have laughed at my instructor saying I had to, to take this. So, um, you know, I, I learned something there. Was it valuable later on in life? Uh, I, I can tell stories about how terrible it was, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they, are, they are catching on pretty fast. If, if you haven't done this yet, set up a time to go down and test drive one of the Teslas down at Park Meadows Mall. Um, it's just a fun experience. Those are scary, the, the, scary the hot, fast the cars. The hot rumor, do, do you know if this is more than a rumor, that in 2016 Apple is going to buy Tesla? Um, and it's more, it's, I mean, it's a little bit more than a rumor. There's indications. Yeah. They're not talking about it. And there's people that say, no, they'll never do it because of X, Y, Z. And other people say, no, it's a good match. And here's the indications why they've already started the process. But, you know, that, that's one of the things Tesla needs. It needs to, to scale up so the prices come down. Um, the technology is there at this stage that m a lot more people would use electric cars. I think it's mostly the price. Yeah, one, one of the things about the Tesla is that they have a download every month. And so after a year, and it, they'll make this in the sales pitch, is that your car is actually a better car after a year than the year before. None, none of the other cars can say that. So what's, what's interesting, though, is that once uh, products go from a physical product to a digital product, then we start reaching these exponential growth curves and change. So we can start implementing changes at a far faster rate. So we go from um, you know, a regular house to a smart home. We go from uh, you know, just a regular car to smart cars. And, and uh, all of these technologies, as soon as they get into the digital world, changes start happening exponentially faster. And that's, uh, that's why we're seeing so much change in the world right now. Um, Rob? And, and, and those are the kind of things that make the chain a really large company. For instance, people are concerned about, about waste or, or, or ingredients, toxic ingredients in food, and they hate really large corporations like Walmart and McDonald's. But when Walmart or McDonald's makes the switch, that's really what changes it. So somebody, a country with a lot of money. But I tracked for a number of years. I was a big fan, still am, of fuel cells figuring that's the real future, not electric cars. Mm -hmm. And I saw the facts and figured. I interviewed people on the phone. I looked at local newspapers. Yes, they broke the ground, the bulldozers, here's pictures, and we're going to build the world's largest fuel cell plant with actually one of us in Long Island. That was 20 years ago. <coughs> um, so, you know, sometimes, uh, you, you know, uh, Paul Sappho? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I heard him speak once, and he had this really great quote, um, which is, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. I think all the signs, all the indicators, it, it just that kind of, it's, it's, it's really definitely happening. But you got to be a skeptic about it. It's not so much if, it's when. Yeah. What, we're running out of time, so okay, Tom, maybe, what do you want to do? Uh, maybe two more questions here. We'll go. So what's your take on the recent advances in biogenetics and all the impacts? Um, there's a lot of scary stuff there. <laughs> the, uh, the scariest actually is the CRISPR yeah, technology. Yeah, the um, uh, it has the potential to cure lots of things, um, but um, invariably we're going to figure out how to use it wrong. Um, is it, would it be a good idea for uh, us to design babies that have six fingers on every hand? Or maybe they need three legs. Maybe they all need to be eight feet tall. Um, there's this one strange group out there that thinks that 
Uh, we could preserve the planet much better if we were all shorter people, if we were all less than three feet tall. Um, and, and so you have all these bizarre notions out there of what would be good for society. And so, yeah, it has the potential to go woefully wrong. <laughs> Uh, yeah, one, one last question. Yeah, I have to disagree with you on the cars and the plug-ins and the hybrids and the whole concept of plug-in cars. I, I was at the Da Vinci Institute uh, Inventors Conference here a couple of months ago, and I, re I rode in the uh, Tesla car. Okay. And it was on a 2006 Lotus body Tesla car. And I, the gentleman was uh, very nice to give me a ride. We went 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. We jumped right up to 100 miles an hour. And it's very impressive. And I said, well, what do you do after you run out of electricity? He said, well, I've got to recharge the car. And I said, why? He said, how far do you go? He said, about 200 miles. How long does it take to charge? He said, four to eight hours if I use 120 volt or 240 volt. The trouble is people think just by plugging it into a wall, it's clean energy. It's, it's where's the electricity coming from? And right now we went from 50% to 35%. If you look at the profile of energy in the U.S. right now, nuclear is 20. Fossil went from, uh, coal plants went from 50 to 35%. Then you have the alternative fuels, wind and solar and all the other stuff. So the so bottom line is that we don't need that because we're going to magnetic energy in cars. We modified a car, no electricity, no fuel, 5,000 miles, we just stopped driving it. 12 volt battery just causes initial inertia, magnetic energy takes over, we can integrate it with radio wave energy coming from the sun, it's around us right now, it's so, there. So, so let me, let me so comment on that. Energy, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, the, um, uh, if you think about 10 years from now, stepping out in front of your house, punching in your smartphone, you want to go shopping, you want to go to school, you want to go to work, driverless car comes and picks you up, takes you to where you want to go, uh, and then <coughs> picks somebody else up from there and takes them to where they want to go and so on. Then we, we transition from this just-in-case mindset, I have a car in my garage just in case I need to go somewhere, to this just-in-time mindset. I can summon a vehicle whenever I need it. Now, once we no longer need to own our own vehicles, and that might take more than 10 years, but we, we end up transitioning to these large fleets of vehicles that somebody owns out there, and these large fleets of vehicles are going to be powered by, we don't care. We only care about getting from point A to point B. Since we don't own the vehicles any longer, we're not going to care very much how it's powered. Um, and so these fleet owners, who can ever carve the best deal are going to have a huge uh, influence on how cars are designed in the future then. And, um, and so these fleet owners will own millions of cars. Right, and, and this is the thing that astonished me some years ago. I would never have predicted some of the things I don't, you know, I don't know it could be right all the time anyway. But I came out of the counterculture and I was biased, not because I disliked marijuana, but that the culture you know, was too stern and rigid and we would never have legal marijuana. I, I mean, I was absolutely astonished. The biggest issue with cars, it's the number of them. It's yeah. total congestion. So yeah, whatever the issue is, it's going to be solved with the fuel at some point, by mandate or by brilliant breakthrough, right you know, a magnetic propulsion system, whatever it is. What, what's astonished me right now is, is, is the transition from everybody having to have a car in Western culture to not necessarily so, and, it, and Denver is one of the places that's right underway. It's under our noses. Um, five developments from the Medici Corporation, um, uh, quasi, it's, it's a private um, 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 uh, um, industry or, or group, but it's funded a lot with funny money. They put up high rises across from light rail stations, and they got a waiver, and the one I saw over at South Delaware Street right off of Santa Fe, next, uh, uh, next to the, um, to Evans Light Rail Station, um, they got away with half of the required by code parking spaces mm. because it's a subsidized. It's not. It's not subsidized housing for the poor. It's, uh, I forget what the term is, but it, you have to have a job. So you you have to be qualified. And you can only get a get a rental there if you're working. And the people there at there don't want cars. They don't have them. They want to walk across the street, get on the light rail, and they all have bicycles. So a certain number of them, percentage are millennials. That's the key. It's the younger generations already figuring it out, and they don't have to battle the culture, which in many cases is unconscious. I'm going to have a car because I'm going to have a car. You grew up that way. I'm going to smoke cigarettes because I smoke cigarettes. And as soon as people start thinking about it, cracks in the armor, it's happening. 
And so there's hope, there's at this point at least hope for the future that we're not going to die in gridlock. But there's a bigger <laughs> issue than however those individual cars are. Well, there, there's a bike coming out. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I think this has been a fascinating discussion.